Hello, hello, hello. How's everybody doing? Woo, good. Hello. My name is Benjamin Powers. I'm the technology reporter at Grid, and you are here to hear about one thing good, one thing bad, and that is NFTs, scams, and security. But before we dive into it, I want to give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves to you. Well, thank you. I'm very pleased to be back again today to speak about security. Uh, I'm Arielle Wengroff. I'm VP of Communications at Ledger, which is the world's most secure platform for crypto and digital assets. Um, and that means that everything from content to education to marketing and how we come to life is, is part of what I help do. And it means building a relationship with the community and, and folks like you. So I'm really excited to dive in. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Maria Badwa. I'm an investor at Sound Ventures, and I also work on um, a few different NFT projects, including Stoner Cats and the Gimmicks. And I'm also on the board of ApeCoin, and uh, recently we did a, an airdrop for ApeCoin, and there was a lot of scams out there. And so this is something that's very, very near, near and dear to my heart. No, absolutely. And I thought we'd start off with a little bit of news to help Pepper in this intro, this conversation that happened during consensus. But I don't know if any of y'all have been following the Seth Green saga with Fred Simeon, but... Uh, Seth, you know, clicked on a phishing link, got his board ape stolen, that he was developing IP for a television show around, had that ape sold to an anon a synonymous NFT investor for about $200,000, and he recently just bought it back for about $300,000, which just shows, you know, no matter how expensive your NFT, security should always be a priority. But I wanted to start out and get, you know, you all's reaction to this news. Maria, let's start out with you in terms of, you know, how this could have been prevented or just overall what's going on. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, well, I mean, it's a really interesting conversation around. Okay, if you're if you're hacked, do you actually own your IP, and can you continue to make that content? That's a whole other story. Um, I think the lesson here is kind of like even if you have, I mean, because he just clicked on a phishing link, I think, and 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 then and then it was he, you know, it was like an NFT trader maybe or something like that, and it was just stolen. Um, but but we're still operating on these Web 2.0 rails, and so as much security as we can put in place or as many protective provisions we have, we're still limited to kind of what we have available to us. And so we're kind of like playing this line between Web 2 and Web 3, and we're not quite where we need to be. Um, so in general, my recommendations are never click on links that you don't know or that you, you haven't identified. Only trust official sources. Triple check a URL. And if you have a friend, send your friend a URL so that they can actually verify it for you, um, especially when we're talking about assets that are like significant in value. Like, I think it's just always best practices to, to, to triple check everything that you do. I'm just, uh, like, all I picked up <laughs> at the end was send your friend the link so they can test it for you because it just makes me feel like you're sacrificing your friend instead of yourself, but, um, uh, which, you know, YOLO. But um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that, truthfully, we're just so early, right? Like, you know, uh, it's, it's like when you would get, we were talking about this before, but when you get an email and it says, like, if you don't send me $5,000, I'm going to release X, Y, and Z. And they're life events that you know didn't even happen, but you still get nervous about it, right? And this is that version of it for Web3. And I think for Seth, what's relevant to also bring up is he was actually planning to use his ape for IP for a TV show. And by having that ape get rugged, he actually couldn't go through with a bigger IP deal. And so what it shows is that, you know, the future of NFTs are around these different utility uses. And by having security risks, there's a greater risk to the ecosystem, to your personal investments, um, and to the future of what you want to do with those assets. So I echo everything that was said around security. Um, of course, I would recommend a, a hard wallet um, because you know, keeping your private keys on the blockchain just increases the level of vulnerability that you have. But additionally, it also just shows that no matter what you do, you're sort of mitigating against human error. And the amount that he had to pay back to get that back means that instead of just buying another one for cheaper, which most people probably would do, except for the affiliation, is probably so that he could continue on those other IP deals. And so I think it's just really important as a test to kind of like also the fact that we'll start to see more security at scale for these treasuries because Boss Beauties also just had a hack um, last week as well. No, and I think it's really important. And so I'll scale this back a little bit and start at high level. And then we're going to go deeper on the utility and on the security in particular. But something I think is really important is obviously there are scams and security issues in crypto. Like that is nothing new to this ecosystem. They exist in other places, certainly. But it's a particular uh, 
a particular bug or thorn in kind of user sides here, and they scale in terms of their complexity, in terms of their simplicity, and everything that a scammer you know, gets into it, whether it's social engineering or just mass phishing links or stuff like that. And so, you know, NFTs really attracted a audience that was not intimately familiar with crypto. They popped in a way that is separate, um, and I don't think users always understand if they're just going straight to OpenSea for the first time or they're you know in it for whatever reason, the ecosystem they're walking into. So again, starting at a high level, base digital hygiene. If you're a newer NFT user or something like that, you know what are y'all's top three recommendations? Okay, all right, I'll take it. Uh, yeah, I would say the one thing is that if you're new to NFTs, inherently though, you should be faster to understand stealth custody. Like there is, there is a better link there. Now what I would say is most people will come into the space, they'll buy an NFT, they'll be part of a community, and then to the point that was made earlier, they get so excited to participate in something else, that's when the mistake happens. There's no deep breath, there's no friend that they're working with, and so the biggest things I would recommend is, yeah, take a step back, get a hardware wallet, make sure that you're not storing your MetaMask seed phrase um, on your phone or on that. I mean, I would recommend not even have, you know, you know, you know my feelings, but um, the reality is, is if you copy and paste things on your clipboard, that is vulnerable to being hacked and taken. And with Web2 infrastructure, you have the ability to get most things back. So we feel more comfortable with that level of risk. But if you're a newbie, you probably don't understand uh, the fact that, you know, I actually was at lunch with someone earlier, I was talking about how he had two clone X's taken, you know, just by, by literally something quite simple. So it's, it's very, very common. So you really have to, you have to set up a wallet at the beginning and you have to be dutiful about it. I, I echo all of that. So set up a hardware wallet. Don't store your seed phrase anywhere digitally or publicly because like, that's, that's how you get access to, um, to your wallets. I think the other thing that's important to remember is that this ecosystem and scams have evolved so much over the last year, right? So, I mean, when, like last June or July, when you were signing transactions, it was actually pretty safe, relatively safe, to sign transactions blindly and without having to know, you know, like, who you, without having any risk of like someone um, of signing a malicious uh, what's the word, transaction and then having someone has to take your assets. But now it's evolved to the point where, okay, actually that is a risk. Like you actually do need to worry about what you are signing and where the links are coming from. I mean, even back then it was like when there were official links posted in Discord, right? There weren't so many Discord hacks and so you could actually trust those links. And now that we've seen, we've seen so many hacks on official, um, official accounts that you can't even trust those necessarily. And so I think part of you know, best security hygiene is also being aware of what's happening and how the ecosystem is evolving over time. Um, and, and that's, I think, how we can you know, stay safe. That's actually, there's just one other point around that that I think is really smart, which is that you know, if you're getting an NFT, a lot of the time you're buying into that community. And so you are maybe paying attention to the roadmap or their communication and announcement styles. And if you're not doing that time, you're more vulnerable as well because that's what happened with Boss Beauties. You know, Binesh, who's their, uh, runs their operations, got hacked. Something got posted in their Discord. And if you're a Boss Beauties holder, which I am, you know that they actually don't make announcements that way. But if you're a Boss Beauties holder and you don't understand their communications patterns, you could click on it and that's what happened to a lot of people that lost their Boss Beauties and they decided leadership wise to buy them back for their community. But um, it, it, you, that's also something, right? Like pay attention to the long term communities you want to be a part of and then learn the way that they work. It's also understanding too, I think kind of what marketplaces you're dealing with, right? Like OpenSea is not <laughs> decentralized. Some markets are decentralized. And so like, you know, in the instance of, uh, of Seth Green, you know, OpenSea kind of froze in that NFT, but it was being transacted in other marketplaces. And so like, you know, I covered some of the initial hacks that happened on OpenSea when it was just starting up, but still had like huge volume um, going on it. And the people were able to get their NFTs back because the company was able to do that. But at the same time, these individuals didn't even have like 2FA on their accounts. And so like, when I say high level, it's like even that sort of thing, like use the tools that are being like pressed at you and recommended to you just at a starting point. But no, definitely those are absolutely things that you should be looking out for. And, and 2FA with an authenticator app, not with your, mo well, not with your, what, your phone number. Yeah, exactly. And the, and the other thing to think about there is when you think about the volume of transactions on OpenSea, that's billions of unsecure transactions that are happening at a regular basis. And it's projected that actually 10% of the world's GDP could be in crypto by 2027. 
So if you think about that value number and the actual unsecure value related to that, we won't ever see mass crypto adoption at the level that we know will happen if we actually don't all figure out some of the security elements because it's such a barrier to, to entry into maintenance. So when it comes to figuring out the security elements, right, like when you're thinking about this as an ecosystem more generally, there's not, you know, there are very specific tools that people can use, right, but there's not kind of a holistic understanding from the community at large, like these are our security practices, like projects are getting spun up, projects are collapsing, like things are getting hacked constantly. Um, and I'd be curious about what are some of the directions that you all want to see just generalized security practices take? Um, writ large within either individual NFT communities or just in this e ecosystem more broadly? I mean, I think one of the things that I think about is, so uh, when, we, when we launched ApeCoin, there were so many accounts that came out that were scammy, that were like mimicking the ApeCoin um, official account, because I don't even think it was verified right when we dropped, and so it was easy for someone to mimic it. And they had like, you know, slightly different URLs or names, and then they would constantly, as people were, were posting about ApeCoin, right, they would come in and they would spam, like, hey, do you need support, right? Like, click this link, or message us here, or whatever it is. And you saw that same behavior also happening in Discord um, and on these other platforms. And so what I actually really want to see is I want to see this eco a, safe, a trust and safety ecosystem emerge between all of the major platforms, so like Twitter, Instagram, Discord. Because even though you can't map the, you, you can't share user information, it's not easy to do that. What you actually can share, though, is URLs, right? And so if someone's pointing to a scammy URL on Twitter, Discord should also be able to know, oh, hey, that's a scammy URL. Let's, let's get rid of that. And so I think that there is actually, there are ways that um, all of these different platforms and ecosystems can be working together, in which they're, they're not today. But I think that they could do that, that would help everyone. I think that's an incredibly important point because most of the platforms that are taking revenue or market share from Web3 utility aren't taking any accountability for the security and maintenance in the space. And Discord and OpenSea and others should absolutely be doing that and should be committed to it because it's a huge issue. And of course, there will be different competitors that emerge based on that basis. I think the other thing I would say from a community standpoint and a user standpoint would be education. Because if you take time to have the initial education, and if communities from the top down instill that in their users, they're much less likely to experience hacks and scams. I also think to that point, community moderation is evolving because there's such an element of brand protection. You know, we have a you know, chief information security officer, and all he does all day long with his team is actually vet thousands and thousands and thousands of subdomains and fake sites and accounts that are trying to actually embody the Ledger brand. And we, when people get hacked, will report it to different police stations in different parts of the world and then help try to trace it down and get people's assets back. And so it's like we're always just trying to do as much as we can, but if these other major partners, which are Web2 partners, don't take accountability, then anything that you do will still be in spite of their behavior. And honestly, to that point, getting developers really excited about building security infrastructure into their code, because then the things that they build going forward will have that in mind. No, I think that's so important because like that, that work takes a huge amount of time and money and effort, and it's not something that is like, should be taken lightly. You know, we think about things like compliance and crypto and think about, you know, navigating a whole patchwork of different regulations and stuff like that. But like trying to get subdomains stripped from a server and like unsupported and actually such that they are gone, like you have to go through so many different hoops to do that. And so there's definitely efforts that can be taken on the company side that I think are really important. And there is certainly a conversation going on about like, is Discord the best way to like have communities congregate? Because there are certainly limitations on the security there. And then people also think, you know, if somebody's in a Discord, they are a part of this community, have been vetted in some way, shape, or form, and that is certainly not always the case um, when thinking about this. But, you know, we were talking a bit about the different shapes and sizes that scams are taking uh, and their complexity or not. But, you know, out of curiosity, you know, given you all watch this space, what are some of the more complex or just intense scams that you've seen uh, in your experience? I mean, you could, you, I mean, you could, we talk about it all day long. You could, you could find some that are really intense um, deep links you, you can find some that actually, if you get just the email, like if you open the email, it's embedded into that data um, to be able to hack you. Uh, there are some where you, I mean, even, you know, it's funny because complex is also simple. Like I remember when Doodles recently, I was just getting spammed with all of these Twitter accounts where it looked entirely like a Doodles account, but one tiny thing 
was different. And that takes time and energy. And I spend a lot of time, this is my life, and I almost completely just made a mistake. So we do find that um, hackers, which I also think is an interesting topic, there are kind of white hack hackers for good, and then there are hackers that are obviously trying to break through domains. And we at Ledger are seeing that some people in the hacking community aren't reporting in the same capacity. And there's actually a lot of conflict going on within hackers about different geopolitical issues. And that therefore creates more volatility in the spam and hacking space because of the way that they target. So I know that that sounds really like insane and meta, but that's actually the world that we live in right now. So I actually think spending like a little bit of time in that space will help you kind of understand as well what to look out for. But basically just like don't click anything that you don't know <laughs> and uh, like truly and, and, and I know, you know, that sounds nuts, but if you like your stuff, don't do it. Um, I, I, I was thinking about the Axie Infinity, the Ronin Bridge hack for Axie Infinity, which was, I mean, they, I can't even remember how much they sold, but it was something like $600 million or something like that. Um, and it was a, a, a five of seven multi-sig, right? So they already had this additional layer of protection in place where the only way that you could move assets was you need five of seven people to like click yes and approve the transaction on their wallet. And what these hackers did, I think it ended up being North Korean hackers who were responsible for this, but they did this crazy elaborate social engineering attack where they found the five, five of the seven people um, they, who, who controlled, who were on this multi-sig and they got their seed. They somehow got their seed phrase and it was a very direct, deliberate attempt to find these five people and, and to capture that, um, those, those seed phrases. But I'm going to say to that point, this is why it's very important to understand where your seed phrase is stored and how you're utilizing different, at that level of a treasury, enterprise solutions. Because if you are a holder of a seed phrase for a business or an entity, that puts you at such an incredible amount of risk and the community. So that's one of those complex ones where, because obviously the multi-sig wasn't secure enough, it inherently put them in a vulnerable space, even though multi-sig should make them more secure. So it's like you can't skip the steps. And it's so, it's, it's like this incredibly frustrating tension where, you know, we're talking about this is like, is this thing safe? Yes, but. Like, is this thing safe? Well, yes, but. And kind of unfortunately it comes down to like humans are inherently not secure. We're creatures of habit. We do things. Sometimes we're stressed. We're thinking about something else and you click on something, but also, you know, social engineering attacks. You respond to different stimuluses. And that's what you're trying to mitigate and triage is just like the amount of risk you're willing to take and then correlating that to the amount of security and effort you're willing to put in, right? Like if somebody's just getting into this for the first time, I mean, I say that, it's like, they're probably not spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I was like, well, that's not true. We've definitely seen that happen uh, <laughs> as these things have popped. But, you know, we've talked about understanding the communities and those 101 educational steps and taking a step back. And it's not just communities, right? It's not just understanding what an NFT is. It's understanding all the associated security mechanisms that go along with that, particularly if you're putting huge money into it. And I think in, you know, the market is certainly less frothy now, but particularly early last word is incredibly frothy. And you saw people thinking they were going to miss out. You saw like NFTs being dropped constantly and you saw people trying to flip them. And people were like, oh, well, look, like that person's getting rich. I want to do the same thing. And I think a lot of people skipped or trusted companies almost entirely to keep these things safe for them. And, you know, I think in crypto at large, like certainly there is a, there's margins you're operating on and there's opportunities to being there early. But I would say like, as we've seen time and time again from hacks, scams, everything else, like taking time can be a boon, like in a lot, <laughs> in a lot of uh, different ways. And so thinking about that scaling of your risk and the security efforts you need to take, you know, what are some deeper security mechanisms that people can employ if they really are, they've got deep in their bags, like they are holding a lot of NFTs and this is in some cases their livelihood. <laughs> Well, I would say the first step they can take, because Web3 eventually will also be that your digital identity will likely be stored within these capacities as well, so it's just good to pattern build, but um, you really should have a cold wallet. You should make sure that your seed phrase is either spread out or in a place where um, it's not easily accessible and no one else knows where it is. Uh, I, would, I would say, honestly, including members of your family. Um, you should, if you want to be the most intense, you would probably want to use some type of laptop or desktop device that doesn't have any other like data or metadata on it that could be uh, that could have something embedded in it that could be a vulnerable phishing attack for you. Um, and then you would you want to use a, a more secure browser 
to utilize that experience for purchasing, for staking, you know, whatever you're, whatever you're sort of doing, and then you take your time. So uh, in that case, then you're probably not doing it on the go. But truthfully, uh, if you're using a, if you're using a ledger and like I carry it around my neck, it's totally fine. I could do, I, you know, I do that because if I want to mint something from the plane, I can, and I know someone's not, you know, hopefully going to get me. But like that would be the most intense thing I would recommend. Uh, and just to add on to that, so if you do use a dedicated laptop, uh, don't have any of your own, like don't sign in with your Apple ID or something like that. Like make sure that it's, it's not affiliated with your personal identification at all. Um, the other thing I would say is like, use a VPN. Using a VPN is just general best practice, best hygiene. Um, and then the other thing that I, I do, well, I do this personally, um, but I like to, uh, you know, diversify my assets across multiple wallets. So if one, if I sign, if I sign a malicious link on one of them, right, I, I'm only vulnerable to the assets that are in that wallet and not in the wallets, the other wallets that I have. And it's great with, Led, like with Ledger and with any, any of these hardware wallets, it's very easy to add a new wallet um, and to spin one up and to move assets around. And so I like to do that. So no one point, no one wallet is, you know, at, at risk of, of losing everything. No, I think that's a really good point. And certainly not everybody here needs to go to that level, right? Like <laughs> that is really hard to do and it takes a lot of time and energy, but it's like there are instances in which that needs to be the case. And so again, just like understand your risk profile, understand what could be taken. I think diversification of wallets is one easy way to potentially, you know, just create as many obstacles, make yourself as much of a pain in the butt to get to as possible because on the hacker's end, right, they do a risk evaluation that's like, Early, like, excuse me, an ROI on like the amount of time and energy and forms that it's going to take to go after you, particularly in terms of like social engineering things. And there's two, there's two, like the reason why I think wallet diversification is one, is one um, tool and mechanism that you have to, to stay more safe is because, you, so your seed phrase, your seed phrase can get you access to, you know, all of the wallets that you have, let's say like in your, in your hardware wallet, in your, in your ledger. Um, but when you sign a link, like let's say I sign on NFT trader or whatever, or I'm like rede trying to redeem for an NFT and I, and I sign this, this transaction transaction, they only have access to the stuff that's, that you're signing in that one specific wallet. So it's different than your seed phrase, where your seed phrase can get you access to all of the wallets that you have. For links and things like that, it's kind of limited to your one specific wallet that you're signing with. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's true. And, and I would say we see more and more people diversifying the wallets that they're using. And um, if you lose, but then also, like, if you're nervous about it, you can just cut that one off and get another one. Like, there's actually tools that you can use online where you can see how having one seed phrase actually generates thousands and thousands and thousands of others. And, you know, our CTO was joking with me, but he literally was on an airplane recently for, for something. And he was just able to get into the airplane Wi-Fi because he didn't want to pay, like, the 1999 to get onto it, and so he was like, yeah, it was easy for me, I was on the plane, blah, blah, to like, you know, like set it off the cuff. These people are incredibly sophisticated. Like, this, it's not a joke, and, um, and the reality, too, is with games and with what we're seeing for other mechanisms for Web3, which is, I think, important, because the use case for an NFT today is not the use case for an NFT a year from now, and these, the, the build that's happening, like, just, yeah, just create these extra vehicles. So that doesn't have to be hard, right? Like, it's actually not hard for me to use my device. And the pin code that I use at the beginning is also just as important as, uh, as protecting. And yeah, so just take those steps. No, absolutely. And I think that's a really important point that the utility for NFTs is changing. They very much so started out as one thing. Um, and, you know, I, somebody, an old editor of mine, you know, he kind of had this phrase, it's like, all right, NFTs are just a key, but we've only figured out how to, like, paint it one color um, thus far. And I think that's a really apt way to think about it. And, you know, as a privacy and security reporter, in part, I always joke that I'm, like, 50 more stories away from, like, pure tinfoil hat territory, because I'm like, it only gets the worse the deeper that you <laughs> I mean, get into this. I mean, literally, our founder, Nicolas Baca, was, I was talking to him recently, and he was joking to me, and he was like, I literally regularly still test out other things to just see like what are the security vulnerabilities and we have something called our dungeon which is our white hack hackers and they are in a room that's locked that no one's allowed to go in unless it's authorized and they hack everything constantly to make sure we're as secure as possible and they always say like if you find a wallet on the street bring it to us because we can actually figure out like whose it is but like it it's wild what's out there and what's available and it will just be the way that we live our life like it that's just the future Okay, and so I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it slightly scarier, I'm sorry, folks, but like, as we see the utility use cases increase and they start to plug into more things, is that just gonna increase the attack vectors for hackers? 
Well, I, th I think it depends, right? And I was I was actually on a panel earlier where we talked we were talking about the future of NFTs, and and I actually think that NFTs and the speculative market that we've had, it was it was fun, but I think actually. It's going to be moving away from that. So I think you're going to see a lot of new brands coming in, um, trying out new utilities with NFTs that might not have a financial price associated with it. It's kind of like what you've seen with POAP. POAP has done such a great job about building a brand. There's no secondary volume, but it's about building these communities and having these badges and letting NFTs represent sort of like the clubs that you're a part of. And so I actually think the the financial aspect of NFTs, I think, will, as, as bigger brands come into this space, I think it'll be less about that. So my hope is that the scams and the hacks are, like, it's, it's less, people have less financial incentives to do it. Uh, I think that we'll see, I, I agree with that, and then I think on top of that, because we'll see more coming into the space, we'll also see more things like recovery We'll see different protection mechanisms that will make people feel more comfortable participating. And then I think you'll continue to see more bolstered operating systems where we will probably get to a point where individuals will need to choose, like, do I want this Web 2 hardware device that you know I can have Instagram on and TikTok and it's less secure and I use it for these things. And then I use this device and it's completely secure and it's my Web 3 place and these developers have built apps with security infrastructure built into it. So when I play a game, when I get my assets, it immediately is logged in through my wallet. And it's not even a question of like level checking, which I think is the problem and the friction of where we are now. Yeah, and I think it's really important. And, and I guess what I was thinking about that is like once you start attaching like IP to NFTs and developing shows around them, that makes it much more costly for you to just say, okay, I can't have this. Because it's not just that you paid 200,000 or $300,000 for this thing. It's that you built out multimedia digital empires in some ways uh, basing on it. And, and something I was curious about, and maybe you know, none of us can speak to this, but you know, Seth Green was threatening to sue uh, this individual and like, go after them in the court system. And it, you know, it seemed he chose something else that was probably easier and he has the money to do this, you know, pay you know, however many thousands of dollars to get it back. But it feels like you know, the court systems are so poorly set up to try and address this particular issue that security is just trying to stop that from happening in the place. The methods to redress are so poor that this is a place to begin. But I'd be curious about y'all's reflections on you know, situating this in that legal atmosphere. But even if you think about as well certain regulatory issues that are emerging within different countries and then therefore certain um, you know, artists, collections being shut down or paused on those exchanges or, or platforms, uh, the nation state structures of which we exist in IRL do not reflect the utility and value of what we are building URL. And so it's a very challenging thing, I think, to have these discussions still because when you're in Web3 or when you're spending time online, you kind of live in a borderless world. And like, I don't mean to be too heady about that, but then you go in and you live everyday life and there are frictions that don't make sense anymore. So no, I don't think the court system is set up properly around this. Although we have seen recently, of course, you know, Nate from, from uh, OpenSea being held in by that from the FBI. So there, they, we're, we're gonna enter into a very sticky zone. Um, and I think most people are not interacting in a capacity where they will be vulnerable to that. But I think we'll start to see a lot more of it because it means different things about the value of an economy and stable and fiat and all of that. And so I think I gotta wrap this up soon, but just maybe what are one or two projects that you all are looking at, whether that be excitement about the NFTs themselves or potentially security mechanisms that you wanna see being developed and moving forward. Um, I think v Vitalik talks a lot about social recovery, right? So it's like uh, your, you know, your social wallet. So not having a seed phrase or having some type of alternative to a seed phrase because that, that becomes like your one point of vulnerability. And so I, I'm very excited about that. I want to see new projects who are working on ways to, um, to hold your private keys in a very secure way that has more efficient recovery mechanisms that aren't dependent on you just writing it down on a piece of paper and then finding that piece of paper later. Yeah, I would. I agree with that, and I would say keep an eye on Ledger for some things for that. Uh, and I think always. some yeah. alpha. And then I think the the other thing is like education, right? Like I'm really excited for education disruption with NFTs as a utility to show certification around learning. And I think there's an incredible opportunity there. And a lot of the IP that's being developed through visual NFTs are stimulants and reasons for people to learn and be incentivized to do so. So I think that beginning of like new people coming into the space and thinking about what they build is amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time, both of you, and thank you all for being here. I think that's going to wrap this, but I do have a limited amount of desks to give away if you want to find me after this. Again, thank you for being here, and we hope you take some home with you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.